Hello and welcome to another pre-lab session on YCP Chemistry Labs. Today we're talking about the calorimetry experiments, part of the General Chemistry 1 sequence at York College of Pennsylvania. So the goal of this week's lab will be to examine several reactions using a calorimeter in an effort to determine which reaction has the greatest energy change during that process. Almost all chemical change uh, are accompanied by energy changes, and the, the branch of chemistry that is devoted to studying the, the transfer of energy during chemical processes is known as calorimetry. So often we use a calorimeter to help us study these. Uh, a calorimeter, in layman's terms, essentially creates a, a small mini-universe of its own. Uh, so we have simply a, a very well insulated container that prevents the exchange of energy between the outside world and the contents of the calorimeter. Inside the calorimeter then we often put a few different things. It's very common to perhaps put a liquid inside your calorimeter and then something else, be that uh, perhaps a solid or a chemical reaction that would be in there as well. The reason we would do this is that these two are now connected and they make up the entire body of your mini universe. And the first law of thermodynamics is that there is no net change in the energy of the universe during any chemical or physical change. If our universe is comprised of two pieces, the liquid and the other part, then the energy change of those two pieces are equal and opposite to one another. Now, energy can be moved in and out of systems by two unique processes, heat and work, as hopefully you've learned in your lecture part of the course to this point. However, most chemical processes involve only heat or the heat component is tremendously larger than the work component. Therefore, heat is a very, very good estimate of how the total energy is changing for many, many chemical systems. Heat is symbolized by the letter Q. So I'm just going to change this to the heat lost or gained by the liquid in our calorimeter would be equal and opposite to the heat gained by the other part. So our other part in today's uh, experiment will be a chemical reaction. And the liquid will really be what we rename the surroundings of that chemical reaction. It will be where the chemical reaction occurs. So let's look at a real calorimeter for a moment. We have a fairly simple calorimeter right here. Um, typically our calorimeters come with a little metal cup on the inside. But because we're working with an acid, which could be corrosive to the metal cup, you're going to replace that with a simple beaker, all right, that'll fit right into that. And then there are a couple of holes in the lid, one of which will allow you to insert a thermometer. So you'll be able to measure the temperature of the contents of the calorimeter. Now, we also would like to stir. So we'll just place a simple magnetic stir bar inside our calorimeter, and then we'll place it atop a magnetic stirrer. Be sure that when you're using the magnetic stirrer, you don't turn on the heat component. Definitely don't want to be trying to add heat when we just said the whole goal was to prevent heat exchange between the outside world, which would represent the hot plate down here, and the contents of your calorimeter. So that would be a big no-no. Right? Okay, so that's a little bit about the devices that you'll, you'll use. In the lab today, the reactions that we're looking at are a series of reactions with hydrochloric acid. One of them, for example, is the reaction of the metal magnesium with two moles of hydrochloric acid. This would produce magnesium chloride and hydrogen gas, H2. So you may see some bubbling and the release of gas during the reactions. Don't worry, nothing is toxic or anything, and there should not be any flames used for any other part of the procedure today. So we should uh, not have to worry too much about uh, the flammability hazard created by the hydrogen gas. Right. At any rate, uh, I'll give you the hint that this reaction is exothermic. So if this reaction happens inside our calorimeter, 
the reaction, the rearranging of the molecules, imagine this was uh, a hydrochloric acid molecule being ripped apart and then the two hydrogens coming together to form a new molecule and the magnesium and chlorines coming together to form new molecules. Those new bonds that are formed are what release the energy in this chemical process. Where does that energy go? It goes to the surroundings, to the liquid. The, the reaction's energy, the heat produced by the reaction, as we just showed, is equal and opposite to the heat uh, of the surroundings. It doesn't really matter which side the negative sign is on, okay? But well, we'll write it this way, okay? Because it's all contained in the calorimeter. That's why I'm able to state the first law and write this simple equation. Now, the surroundings, this liquid, when it gains energy, is going to experience a temperature change. Right? If you were sitting next to a big, big source of energy, undoubtedly you would start to feel hotter. Your temperature would increase. And the exact same thing will happen to the liquid surroundings, the water, essentially, in which this reaction happens. So whenever there is a liquid, or a temperature change, sorry, the formula for determining the heat is to take the mass times the heat capacity times the change in temperature of that system. Okay? Uh, this formula right here is what you'll use as part of your first uh, pre-lab pre question, by the way, to figure out the energy required to raise the temperature of 34 grams of water by 7.25 degrees Celsius. What you need to know is the heat capacity of water, which is provided. This is a unique term for every substance. Uh, waters is particularly high uh, as a liquid, uh, much higher than that of most metals and uh, of, of many other materials. So you, for this first pre-lab question, you would simply take the mass times the heat capacity of the water times the change in temperature. Because that change in temperature is positive, as is the mass and the heat capacity, you'll come up with a positive heat transfer into, meaning that heat is transferred into the water. At any rate, this is how we can calculate the energy change, the heat change, for the liquid in our calorimeter. Now, how do we relate that to what happened in the reaction? The reaction is actually happening at a constant temperature, right? Disassembling our molecules and rearranging their bonds, like I was showing a second ago, that doesn't involve any temperature change but it does involve a tremendous energy change, right? But we quantify that energy change quite differently. We use N times delta H of the reaction, where N is the moles. In this case, it would be the moles of the limiting reactant, which will be our metal. We'll use excess hydrochloric acid. So the amount of energy that's produced by our reaction will depend on how many magnesium molecules we are reacting in it, all right? So this is how we would calculate N, uh, N times delta H is how we'd calculate the Q of the reaction. This side, the right side, is the formula that's related to what you're going to do in the second pre-lab question. If 4.5 grams of ammonium nitrate were dissolved in water, it was noted that 1.445 kilojoules of energy were absorbed by the water. That quantity, by the way, would have been calculated using a formula like we did for pre-lab question one, the MC delta T. So what is the enthalpy of solution? Well, the energy added to dissolve this ammonium nitrate is found by taking N times the delta H, what's called the enthalpy change. It's kind of like the unit price of produce at the grocery store. It's telling you how much energy is required to dissolve an entire mole of this chemical. But 4.5 grams is certainly not one mole of ammonium nitrate. So we could find delta H by taking the Q and dividing it by the moles. So the 1.455 is the Q. And this grams up here needs to first be converted to moles. And then we would have the two values that we need to calculate our enthalpy of solution. So you simply need to take 1.445 kilojoules divided by the equivalent number of moles that 4.5 
grams is for ammonium nitrate. All right. So in the again, coming back to the lab then, we will measure the surroundings, the temperature of our liquid, to be able to figure out how much energy the surroundings absorb. Their temperature is going to go up because the reaction that we're looking at is releasing energy. Our goal is ultimately to figure out that delta H, just like pre-lab question two allows you to figure out the delta H of this dissolving of ammonium nitrate. All right? To get the correct answer that we can compare our experimental value to, we need to perform one other calculation. It's not something we can just look up as the, the true value for the energy change of these reactions, um, simply because there are far too many reactions to list the, uh, the energy change of every reaction that ever might occur. But the way that we calculate the energy change of any reaction theoretically, so what its true value would be, is with uh, Hess's law of heat summation. Pre-lab question three teaches you or asks you to use Hess's law, and you're going to use it as part of the calculations in this lab as well. All right? In pre-lab question three, you're given two reactions whose energy changes are known, and you're asked to use them to find the energy change of another reaction because it's not known. Hess's law says if you can add any two or three or four or any number of reactions together to produce a net outcome that is a different reaction, the energy change of that different reaction is just the sum of the energy changes of all the reactions you added together. So whatever you do to the reactions, you just add together their energies. Okay, now, what do I mean by whatever you do to the reactions? So if we're trying to get two NO2s to react with half a mole of oxygen, we'll allow that improper coefficient for right now, to produce a single mole of N2O5, right? These are sort of the puzzle pieces that we can use to figure out our overall reaction. But the N2O5 in the piece that I'm given is on the wrong side. So I need that to reverse. I need to switch this reaction around. And rather than uh, decomposing an N2O5, I need to show the making of N2O5 from two NOs and three halves oxygen. It's the same reaction, just in reverse. But the first law of thermodynamics, again, of the universe tells us that the energy change, then, of this reaction would have to be negative of the energy change of the original reaction. Because it's in this direction that we absorb 223.7 kilojoules. So if we reverse the reaction, instead of absorbing, we're going to release that 223.7 kilojoules. That's what that negative sign means, right? A negative sign is energy released, right? So that would put the N205 on the right side, which is where I'd like it. If I look at these other puzzle pieces, the other thing I really want is NO2 on the left side. The only other reaction has NO2 again on the right side, so I need to reverse it. So I'll flip it around. NO2 would produce NO plus half an O2. So that's good. But the other problem with this reaction is it involves only one NO2. And I need two NO2s overall. So I'll double that reaction. So not only did I switch the direction of this reaction, which would mean the energy would change, but I doubled it. So I have, you know, negative sign because I reversed the reaction and a times two because I do this reaction twice times what the original energy was. So this would now be, this product would now be the energy associated with having this reaction happen twice in its reverse direction. Now, does this work? So let's look at our reactants over here. Just like in math, we would have to distribute this coefficient of two to the three things in that reaction. These two NO2s then, okay, now what we're going to look at is for things to cancel on either side. 
What I see is that I have two NOs on the left of the first reaction and now two NOs on the right side of the second reaction. So those will cancel each other out. I have three halves mole of oxygen on the left and one mole because I distributed my two on the right. That will cancel out one mole and leave me with just one half. So anything that didn't cancel out drops down and is included in the sum, so to speak. So two halves NO2 plus half an O2 produces N2O5, which is in fact our target or desired reaction. So because I was able to show that this reaction can be thought of as the sum of these other two reactions, all right, when I perform these manipulations, the energy change of this reaction then is simply the negative one, because we reversed it, times the original energy of the first reaction, plus negative two, because I reversed it and did it twice, times the original 57.1 for the second reaction. And when I carry out that sum, that will give me the energy change of the desired final reaction down here. Okay? So that's how you use Hess's law. And you'll be able to use Hess's law in the lab to uh, uh, find the energy change of the reaction we had up here earlier. You'll need, to look up the, uh, you'll need to look up these puzzle pieces, but they're included in any standard uh, uh, general chemistry textbook in the, in the appendix. But real briefly, I'll explain that you'll use what are called the enthalpies of formation of these chemicals. So we had Mg solid plus 2HCl, this will be aqueous, to produce MgCl2, that's aqueous, plus hydrogen gas. So each of these chemicals has a formation reaction. And you can use Hess's law to add together, and you'll, uh, because anytime something shows up on the product side, its reaction ends up needs to be reversed, its formation reaction. So you'll be able to simply add together the enthalpies of formation of your products, multiplying them by their coefficients. That's what N would be, but in this case, that's just one. And then you'll subtract from that the sum of the enthalpies of formation of your reactants, again, multiplied by their coefficients. And this is how you will find the theoretical uh, energy change for this reaction to compare to what you get from the calorimeter experimental method. Okay. So real brief, let's overview again. You're going to use a calorimeter. You'll put it on a stir plate. Uh, you will add some acid. You'll very carefully want to measure out your acid with a graduated cylinder. Uh, you'll add that in, and then you'll use a, a solid. There are four solids available. You and your partner in lab will study two of the solids. You'll conduct three trials of each of your two solids. Okay. So at the end of lab, you'll have a total of six data points. You'll need to share your information with classmates in order to get the other uh, solids, to get information about the other solids. So at the end, there should be a large data sharing endeavor that happens uh, across your lab. Anyway, as soon as you mix your solid with your acid, the reaction will occur. You'll uh, stir it and measure its temperature change. All you need are the initial temperature of the liquid before you added the solid and the final temperature after you added the solid. So when you walk away from each trial, you have three pieces of data, the mass of the solid, the initial temperature, and the final temperature. There's really a hidden fourth piece of data for every trial. That's the 50 milliliters of acid that you use, which should weigh 50 grams because we're approximating its density as one gram per milliliter. When you're done, each trial needs carefully disposed of. Because this is acid and we've added metals to it, it's now waste and we're going to collect it by simply taking the glass beaker out and pouring it into the waste collection bar. Be sure to get the, uh, the magnetic stir bar out with your stir bar retriever and don't pour that into the waste container, please. Okay. And then you set up for your next trial. Okay. So it should be a lot of 
uh, of repetitive work, the reactions are, are going to be the same. Some reactions produce more uh, temperature change than others. So don't be surprised if one set of your reactions has a large temperature change and one has a significantly smaller set of temperature changes. All right. Uh, so I think I've gone over everything to get you ready for, for lab today. You may find yourself wanting to wear uh, gloves uh, if you're uncomfortable with handling the acid. But we're working with a moderately concentrated version of acid today, so it shouldn't be too corrosive um, on, your, on your hands. If you do spill any, uh, immediately go to the sink and wash up and, and obviously wipe it up and consult your instructor. Okay? So I wish you the best today in trying to figure out which of the four reactions that we're studying produces the most uh, energy uh, as you explore calorimetry. Have a good day, and as always, be careful and be safe in the chemistry lab.